In today's hectic world, your life can get busy pretty fast. New technologies have allowed us to text anyone from our phones, email business partners, and check our social media apps. Yet, getting from place to place hasn't quite caught up. Car trips can take weeks, uh, train a few days, and plane still a few hours. Nothing as instantaneous as our communication. But not anymore. A new device called the Telepod allows passengers to step in and be teleported instantaneously to the destination telepod of their choice. Quick, easy, painless. Well, not quite painless. A person can only travel by themselves in the telepod or risk the chance of being genetically fused with the person or thing traveling next to them, possibly creating a whole monstrous species never seen before by man. Be afraid. Be very afraid. This is It Records. Hello, everybody. It's me, uh, you know, one of your hosts, Matt Johnson, as always. And I'm joined with the other co-hosts of the podcast, Lindsay and Pete. Thanks, guys. Thanks for being here. Really appreciate it. Glad you can make some time. <laughs> Thanks for having us, Matt. Uh, always my pleasure. <laughs> you know, you know me. I'm always busy. Yeah. I. You're working with Blumhouse. I barely now. make time for this. Yeah, yeah, of course. Me and Jason are, are go way back. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, so I really appreciate you, you know, coming in and uh, co-hosting with me, as always. Um, But this week, everybody, we did the 1986 film by David Cronenberg, The Fly. I think you're making a mistake. I think you really want to talk to me. Sorry, I have three other interviews to do before this party's over. Yeah, but they're not working on something that'll change the world as we know it. They say they are. Yeah, but they're lying. There is a limit, even to the imagination. Human teleportation, molecular decimation, breakdown, and reformation is inherently purging. Where our greatest creations meet our deepest fears. Something went wrong, Seth. When you went through, something went wrong. You are about to go beyond that limit. weird hairs that were growing out of your back I had them analyzed but they were definitely not human if you saw how scared and angry and desperate he I'm sure typhoid Mary was a very nice person too when you saw her socially no you're afraid to be destroyed and recreated aren't you you're changing Seth everything about you is changing oh no what's happening to me am I dying I want to know what's going on what does the disease want wants to turn me into something else. Oh, no. A fly got into the transmitter pod with me that first time when I was alone. Don't go back to it. It could be contagious. Uh, I'm afraid! Don't be afraid! No. Be afraid. Be very afraid. be confused with the original film with Vincent Price, 1958. And Pete, this was your pick this week, if I'm not mistaken. It was. Um, so uh, maybe if you could just tell us maybe why you chose it, and then I'd also like to see, is this everybody's first time seeing it, or have we seen it before? I have not seen it before. Sorry. Right. Mm-hmm. L- Lindsay's first time. I've seen it before. I also have seen it before. Okay. All right. But it's been like dec- decades. I'm not that old. It's been maybe a, de- <laughs> a decade since I've seen it. <laughs> it's been a few years for me. I would say three years since the last time I watched it. Okay. What what drew you to it this week, Pete? You know, I really don't know. Like, um, so I somewhat sometimes rent movies by my apartment. There's like this little rental shop. And I saw The Fly, and I got two other movies with it, because it was like a deal. And I was like, you know what, I haven't seen these fucking movies in a while. I got like Final Destination, uh, The Fly, 
And then uh, this movie called The Gate, which I've never seen before, but it was like a kind of like kids horror mixture. And I just like wanted to like show. I, my intention was to show like other people who haven't seen it before, but I just ended up watching it by myself. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, but I st- obviously, still loved it. <laughs> mm-hmm. Spoiler alert for my <laughs> for my destroy or defend. Well, those of you who haven't uh, seen The Fly or, or, or heard of it, really, basically it's about a brilliant but eccentric scientist played by the Jeff Goldblum in this film. And he begins to transform into a giant man-slash-fly hybrid after one of his, his experiments goes horribly wrong. That's the general idea of the movie. And before we kind of launch into the plot and sort of maybe um, elements we wish to talk about and production notes for it, um, I was going to just lay out the horror significance, kind of keep that trend going, uh, where this falls in, uh, maybe what subgenre. I think this is definitely maybe one of the best examples of body horror um, that there is out there in horror significance. I think it's the staple of like body horror. It's like the most clear mm-hmm. cut. And then uh, I almost want to, like, I may be overstepping my bounds, but I feel like Cronenberg is like, kind of not the pioneer of body horror but he like kind of put Mm -hmm. it on the map i want to say oh definitely um i'd agree i think that's actually i was doing some research of why he was chosen i think one of the producers who pulled him on board uh, for like a million dollars by the way that's how much he got pulled over for um is he was the director of flesh is what they (laughs) called it because before this he had done a videodrome which pete you talked about in a blog post on the website um and I'm trying to think what he did. Dead was Dead Zone right before this. I think Dead Zone was right before The Fly. Yeah, it was in the, it was in the early yeah. '80s. Yeah. So he was known as like the director of flesh, and that's what he likes dealing with is the idea of the vulnerability of the flesh. So yeah, I think he's perfect for body horror type films, known for them at least. Yeah. Um, he's had a couple ones before that too that were pretty. Body or like rabbit yeah. and uh, um, uh, there's one after that before the fly or after the fly. Before the fly, oh, I, I, I want to say like Shiver. Is that a movie by? Corn- is it Shiver? Shivers. Yeah. Okay. That, that's yeah. It. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's a good one. Yeah. So. Yeah. Um, I read that. Um, originally Tim Burton was supposed to direct this movie, and I'm just like imagining all the ways that it would have been different. If he had, mm-hmm. so I think that would have been really interesting. But uh, what do you guys think about that? Uh, like, I'm intrigued by it because I do enjoy Burton's type of filmmaking, but it would have been a different feel, and I think it would have been more of the style of the 58 version, which it, which is horror, uh, but it's more like uh, it's a I feel like it's a campier horror where like it's not it wouldn't be as like grotesque body horror and as like emotionally sure. connected as you were with these two characters um i'm trying to re- think of one like sleepy like sleepy hollow tim burton did sleepy hollow i wasn't really terrified yeah. by that but it's it's like a stylized horror mm-hmm. yeah i think that's a good way mm-hmm. to put it and i think like <clears throat> the fly remake has such a huge impact on the horror like like genre as a whole that like it's hard to say Anyone, anyone else to direct it besides Cronenberg because it's like such has a huge mm-hmm. effect. I mean, I would like to see Burton do a body horror movie. It probably won't ever happen because I feel like he's just doing all these like kid friendly movies or something now. I don't even know what the hell yeah. he's doing anymore. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. That's true. Yeah, well, this movie, I think, to date is, they say it's Cronenberg's biggest of his career, mm-hmm. so. I'm glad it was him, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, it's his, his biggest, like, commercial success, and I think it's his only critical, like, Oscar success, too. He, he won the okay. Oscar for it. Well, he didn't, but the movie won for Best Makeup, which was yeah. quite spectacular in this film. Yeah, it was, like, it only was recently in effect, too, that mo- that award didn't they make? Didn't we talk about this? How they made it an award for American Werewolf in London? Mm-hmm. Like, that was like the first year. Oh yeah, like the early eighties. Mm-hmm. Was it eighty one? I, 
Wasn't that when the movie early? came out? It was something early uh, yeah. 80s, I feel like. American. So yeah, this was... I could remember. I could remember how old that movie is, but... Yeah, 81. It's... Yeah. Yeah, Lindsay nailed it. Oh, good, good memory. Mm-hmm. I was talking about Cronenberg and his his influence on this. Yeah, he directed it, but uh, he had a very heavy influence on writing it too. Besides just directing it, um, there was an original script which had the hybrid between the fly and the human, which is different than the, the original. The original is basically the person uh, has a fly head for a while, right, and then he becomes a fly size with a, a human head. Which is different than this yeah. film. It's kind of like a it's a gen- molecular and genetic fusion where it's kind of this weird mass of a human that is Jeff Goldblum. Um, that was in the original script that the guy wrote, but Cronenberg had a heavy influence in the rewrites. Kind of changed it completely. Besides that idea, mm-hmm. so it was like originally like the orig- It was originally like how it was before. How was this like? very sci-fi and then it had a fly had it again no, no, no. Uh, this guy the guy who wrote it it's like Pog or Prague his last name is he had the idea that it would Jeff Goldblum look like he does in this movie like that was his idea the hybrid between the two oh but, like okay. the whole story okay. like Cronenberg kind of like made new characters uh, and changed whole settings Compared to what his script does, but he kept gotcha. that idea. That's what. That's like really what really sold him to the script was the idea that he had, that original writer had. Mm. Mm. I, I'm mm. following you. Yeah. Mm. It's a good yeah. idea. But uh, you mentioned Pete just a second ago the sci-fi elements of the original one. Whenever we do a sci-fi horror, I always like to bring this up. Um, where do you think this falls in the spectrum? Is it more? Like a horror, or where? What are the sci-fi elements of this movie? Because I think it. Is, well, I won't say what I think it is, but it has them both in there. You talk for the one we the, just watched, the remake, right? Eighty-six. The fly. Mm-hmm. Um, um, I mean, it definitely is sci-fi horror, like how Alien is like sci-fi horror. Like, I mean, I know they're like totally different, like settings. But they're like rooted in science, kind of mm-hmm. like he created this monster mm-hmm. on accident, kind of like you know Frankenstein was created. Yeah. Um, and then like what? It's weird because it's sci-fi and also body horror. Like it's very clear, like we said, body horror because like the mutations and like falling apart and the grotesqueness. <clears throat> But, um, I would say it heavily leans on body horror, where it's like 75% body horror, 25% sci-fi. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Lindsay, did you see it any specific way? Did you see it more like horror, or... I'm just curious what people see when they watch sci-fi horror movies. I really, I really didn't think of it as horror until closer to the end yeah um it seemed very much like a science you know fiction kind of movie to me and i was like i I mean the whole time you know i don't i think people are going to be more grossed out than scared which i mean that's a facet of horror you know in itself but uh Mm -hmm. so yeah i really like i said it was probably more toward you know the third act that i didn't really start seeing the horror aspect of it Uh, that's interesting um because i had a similar feeling on it um I felt like it was a good blend of... I feel like there's three distinct acts to this movie. The first act is he meets Gina Davis, uh, Jeff Goldblum's character, Seth Brundle, which, by the way, they were dating in real life during this time. Um, Yeah. But it was like they meet each other, he tells her about the teleportation device, they have their relationship, and then that's all sci-fi to me. And then the end of Act 1 is when he goes into the teleportation with the fly, on accident. Didn't know the fly was in there. And then Act Two is like a perfect blend. It's like when we f- first start to see, like he has that, he starts to look kind of weird in his face, and he's eating a lot of sugar, and like having a lot of like energy. Um, but it's it's not too grotesque yet. Um, but you're starting to see those elements where it's blurring into the body horror. And then at the end of the second act is when he figures out that the fly was in there with him. 
um, on his computer. Yeah. And then the third act, I think, is like completely just horror, where it's like he becomes this weird, grotesque looking. You can't even recognize him really anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, All encompassing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But I, I guess I would say, in, in terms of sci fi horror, it's a. It's a horror movie with sci-fi in it, I guess. Mm. Okay. Like I think I think that's the same with Alien, or it's a little different with Alien. I th- <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna go on a tangent <laughs> here, but like Alien is like first and foremost horror, and it's just in a sci-fi el- in- environment. Like the science fiction, there's no science that drives the plot. It's just that they're in space. It's the aliens that drive the plot, and that's not science. That's just that's a monster, just like Cloverfield. That we said it's horror. Well, this one's science fiction driven. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. If you would give it a percentile like I did, what would Absolutely. you say? Absolutely. Uh, for the Fly remake? Yeah, I'd yeah. I'd say it's like uh, 65 horror, 35. I don't know. I, it's pretty. 60, I'll say 60 horror, 40 science fi. 40 sci fi. Because okay. like, it's really driven by the science. Like That's how it becomes the Fly. So that's a big element of it, but then towards the end of that second to third act, it's like straight body horror. And so yeah, it's a pretty good blend, I yeah. thought. Which, if we don't mind, I'm going to throw to a clip I have of David Cronenberg, um, where he talks about why he chose this movie and like what, how it falls into the horror genre and why he made it. Roll yeah. the clip, Pete! <laughs> Bing! Prince of Horror joins me now. Welcome, David. I was David. a Baron once. I guess I've been demoted. But anyway, yeah. <laughs> Baron, Prince, the same levels. At the fly last night, yours truly, perhaps almost in the same way as, oh, we lost our poster here, in the same way as we did in the original, I walked out upset, not only by what happened to my favorite character, Goldblum, but by the gory, horrifying scenes I had seen. Uh-huh. Is that success to you, I have to ask? Well, you'll, you'll have to tell me. I mean, um, it is a horror film. And the people, there are people who go for, for professional reasons who might not necessarily go to horror films uh, ordinarily. They will probably have difficulty with the film. It is a horror film. But of course, as, as you yourself can vouch for, it is also a romance. It's a romance. It's a love story. That, it's very emotional. It's very passionate. It's not a gore fest. It's not a slasher movie. It's, um, it's, quite, it's also very funny. Not in a, in a sense of parody or camp, but it's, a, it's a, 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 an ironic and darkly humorous film, I think. And, um, and it's not, gore is perhaps what you would, is the most spectacular aspect of it, but it's certainly not all that there is in the movie. Well, I, I agreed, and I only saw half of it because of the rest of the time. I was uh-huh. turning away with the rest of the audience. Why is that important, David, and what you're doing? Well, um, it's important because I think the function of a horror film is to uh, allow people to confront things that disturb them about life in general in a, in a relatively safe environment. We, we, are, we are born to test ourselves uh, against what will come. When we're ch- children test themselves uh, uh, in, in terms of s- society and sexuality. And, uh, and later you, you think about things like violence and aging and disease and death and separation. And one of the arenas that you can sort of test yourself is the cinema, is film. You put it all up there on the screen for reaction. Yeah. This is not, though, to, to give you your due, the basic roller coaster ride of thrills that you get when you got a guy in a hockey mask chasing teenage girls around no, for a film, right? That's, I would say so. Some, now, some people say your movies are high art. Uh, uh, where's your opinion in this? Uh, I would agree with those people <laughs> who say it's high art. Uh, and I have never had anybody in any kind of hockey mask. I wanted you to know that. Indeed. Um, those who say they're emetic and vomitous, you, you just say, hey, take it or leave it? Well, the thing is that, uh, I mean, the sort of teen slasher movies, is that's a whole subgenre genre within the horror genre and for a lot of people that is what a horror film is these days but in fact there have always been much there's a lot of room to move and still call your film a horror film hey we're back all right great clip great clip um so we've talked kind of about you know how it's body horror transformation body horror and uh some of the horror sci-fi i think it'd be uh we need to talk about the makeup to some extent um, and the Absolutely. transformation, if you guys want to talk about, do, do we, I, I do we need to talk about I think, <laughs> I think, I think shame on us if we don't, if we talk about the fly. Yeah. Mm. 
<laughs> we could skip over it. <laughs> I mean, it did win an Oscar. <laughs> yeah. Oscar, yeah, I mean, Oscar. I think it was something else, though. Um, I read that he had, you know, toward the most extensive, you know, scenes of his transformation that it took five hours for him to be in makeup, you know, every day uh, with five pounds of prosthetics on him. So that's pretty wild. Yeah. Yeah, I couldn't yeah. imagine that. Because uh, there's so many different, like, stages he went through, too. Seven, to be exact. Uh, and, like... Mm-hmm. Seven stages, man. Which kind of reminded yeah. me. Sorry, and I think it's just kind of like the transformation. Mm. Kind of um, when you see him start to go through that, it kind of reminded me of an American Werewolf in London, just a little bit. You know, that's all I was gonna say. Is definitely mm-hmm. uh, reminded me back to that, um, to those scenes in that movie as well. That's all I had to say. Yeah, I would say both transformations are very iconic. Yeah. And, yeah, I agree. I got those feelings, too, um, about American Werewolf in London. But with that, it's the transformation takes place in, like, one shot. It's one scene um, that they become the werewolf and they turn back. But with this, it's, it's a different iteration each time. The transformation is more gradual. Um, and it's a different look each yeah. time, um, which I thought was very impressive. That's true. And there's actually one stage, and I was doing my research, I don't know if you guys came upon it, that we don't see, that they made, they made this uh, Jeff Goldblum look like something, but it's a deleted scene from the film. Do you guys know of this scene at all? Oh, yeah, I I forgot about that scene. Yeah, it was like... I like... like, It's news to me. Go ahead, P. No, I was going to say... I, I wasn't gonna say much. I was just I I remember what you're talking about, but I don't remember the contents of the scene. Yeah, um, it's it's a pretty infamous scene, I guess, or if you if you're familiar with The Fly, but the scene was, um, you know, Brundle Jeff Goldblum is, is has been turning into the Fly, and he tries to experiment with the baboon, which is what he used initially uses to test the telepod, and he puts a cap in the other telepod, and he fuses them together. Okay. And it's like this grotesque baboon cat creature that comes out and he eventually kills this creature by beating it with a pipe. And that was in the original Toronto screening as well as the following scene that shows him eating out of a dumpster and then uh, killing an old lady who sees him. And And they took it out and I think for good reason because it kind of villainizes him. It makes him makes you less sympathetic with that character that he like kills these Absolutely. two things like ravenously. Where I felt until like the very last like scenes where he's like trying to throw Gina Davis into the telepod and like with their with their child, that I kind of was sympathetic for him, like because he was just kind of curious of like what was happening to him and he wanted to document what was happening, and he wasn't really evil. He was like telling Gina Davis to stay away, like because I'm gonna become aggressive. Um. So, yeah, I was very sympathetic towards him until the very end. So, good thing they took those scenes out, I thought. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I I agree there. Like, um, I remember when I first read about that scene uh, that I was like, oh, man, because, like, usually I, I like, like, director's cuts for the most part where I, like, want to see, like, the full, like, uncut movie, and I get, like, bummed when I hear about, like, stuff that gets cut, but it, it kind of seems like that was, like, the right decision, and, like, ma- like you said, it makes the character more likable, and, like, if, and there's also, like, other set times in other movies where, like, back to Alien, I think the Alien theatrical cut is better than the director's cut, e- even though... The only difference is the director's cut is actually a minute shorter and there's just different scenes chosen for certain scenes and I just feel like it, it like ruins the flow. Okay. If that makes sense. So you think yeah, the theatrical version is better than Ridley Scott's director's cut? Yeah, because he, he said that he was pretty satisfied with like what he had. Good. Okay. But for some reason, he came out with a direct with a director's cut at some mm-hmm. point. Um, 
So I feel like there are some movies where the director's cut is actually worse. Yeah. It's funny you... This is a tangent not related to Fly, but you like you yeah. like the direct the theatrical version of Alien better because it's known with Blade Runner with Ridley Scott that the director's cut is way better than the theatrical version. The original nineteen eighty two yes. one because they cut yeah. out all of Harrison yeah. Ford's narration from the theatrical well, trailer. Well, here's a here's a here's a funny thing about Blade Runner <laughs> is that sequel is great. Go see it. I still need um, to. Sorry, go ahead. You'll love it. You'll love it. Um, there's a director's cut and a final cut. Mm. Final cut is a true uh, director's cut, and the director's cut was like something that the studio did with like um, Ridley Scott's supervision, and he ultimately didn't like it at, at the end. But I actually I remember seeing the director's cut and liking it more mm. because with the final cut, I feel like Ridley Scott kind of George Lucas's it by like updating yeah. certain. Um, graphics and it really took me out of the movie and that's why with the director's cut it's almost the same movie like I feel like it kind of like has the same themes and like ending um, and I, I kind of was like thrown off when they used like the computer graphics at the time they redid it I just didn't like that sure yeah I get that but back to the fly <laughs> yeah, back to in the, the horror podcast. <laughs> um, so yeah, we talked about the makeup and how extensive it was. Um, is there any anything that really jumped out to you guys? Um, any scenes in particular um, that you wanted to talk about, or really the relationship with Brundle and Gina Davis, Ronnie? Sorry, is her name? Can we have a conversation about? Um his ear falling off? Yeah. We could talk about that. <laughs> no, I mean, it was just pretty gross, you know? Yeah, and that's like... Well, it's not the first instant, but... Uh, yeah, that's when Gina Davis... Ronnie, her character's name is Ronnie, sees uh, Brundle for, like, the first time, right? After, like, that he starts to look... That he, he's yeah. looked kind of... Different. It was, yeah, it was four weeks after the last time they spoke, and he looks really... He looks like slimy and like <laughs> crinkly, and his fingernails and his ear falls off. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, it's pretty yeah. intense, you know. Mm -hmm. um, I think that was after like she had initially tried to tell him like, "Hey, you know, like something's going on, and it's like not looking good for you." And he resists her, right? He's like, you know. Um, I don't know what I'm trying to say, but he's, you know, like, they end up, like, having words. She leaves, and then she doesn't come back yeah. for, like, a month, right? And then that's, okay. Mm -hmm. All right, I'm probably... Yeah, and that's when things have gotten significantly worse for yeah. him, so... Yeah, so, in that same scene where his ear falls off and she tries to console him, that is the first time that we learn how he eats. Um, <laughs> ah. Which is his teeth become useless, and he has to vomit a certain acid or whatever onto his food to digest it, and he does that in front of her, right as his ear falls off. <laughs> yeah, it's a real so beautiful charming. scene of uh, mm -hmm. couples <laughs> connecting with each other. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, like myself. it was gross and <laughs> uh, uh, unsettling, but I did also really, I mean. I believe their connection, and there was a lightheartedness to that scene because even when he does throw up on his food, he's like, "Wait, that's disgusting," because he knows like she hasn't seen it. So there's like a realization there. Where he's like, "I'm so sorry, I did that." Like you have no, <laughs> this is all new for you. Yeah. Um, so yeah, there was some some humor and all that. I thought. Do you remember when his teeth fell out and like his fly teeth or whatever the hell they came in or whatever? What do you remember when you call them? Mm -hmm. That was really fucking gross. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I don't like I don't like teeth. Mm -hmm. Like teeth like you stuff like with te teeth yeah. in movies. It's it's really gross to me. Interesting. I mean, it's Fair fingernails enough. for me, and that happened in this movie. I it yeah, grosses me out I don't like think fingernails either. fall out. That was disgusting. Te teeth bother me more than fingernails, I think. Mm-hmm. Like uh yeah. I can't remember what movie that is, but there's like a movie where they like pull someone's teeth out, and I was like, ah. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
Are you thinking of the dentist, Pete? Are you thinking of a dentist again? That's just a profession <laughs> no. in real life. People get paid to do. That. I don't. I don't like the. I don't like going to the dentist at all. Well, I can see why. I know. I don't know anyone that does. <laughs> yeah. I also was uh, when I got my wisdom teeth pulled out. I was like fucking high and fucking laughing gas when they they, they put la- and then just like just they struggled yanking it out and mm. I had like swallowed a shit ton of blood. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I could f- feel it like crunching in my ear and like vibrating, like a vibrating. Yeah, yeah, I got that yeah, too. Yeah, because they fucking they drilled the shit out of it. Mm-hmm. it was, ugh, it's terrible. Yeah, not fun. That's yeah. Mm-hmm. Yikes. Well, another scene that grossed me out. Um, I don't can't really explain why, but is like when Brundle becomes Brundle Fly, like like the Brundle Fly is what he calls himself. Yeah. Where he's no longer even recognizable as a human, I don't think. But he has like the fly eyes and everything, because Gina Davis rips rips his jaw off, and then from there it's like everything starts like falling apart, and he like he's like molding or whatever. I don't even know. Yeah, and I just that really, yeah, it really grossed me out. Mm-hmm. And maybe because it was preceded by him vomiting that onto um, the other character. Is his name Seth or? I don't know if it's his name, but Gina Davis's former love interest from the from the yeah. Uh, I never knew his name throughout the mm-hmm. whole movie, so I think that's a cl- it's Stathis or something, which sounds like a made up name, it does. but I guess that's what his name is. Mm-hmm. It's a cla- I've never heard it. Classic personally. horror movie moment yeah. where you just don't know Clark characters' names. I feel like mm-hmm. you're just like <laughs> they're gonna die anyways. Why mm-hmm. even bother? Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> But yeah, uh, her her ex boyfriend, who's now her boss. Yes, correct. correct. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. And I think we were supposed to take that. I mean, they were together while she was her boss, and like he got her the job, sort of, because she was oh, okay. seeing okay. him. So, but um, uh, talking sense. about that vomit in that scene, when it like it burns away the guy's leg and burns away his hand. Um, because he's holding a shotgun. Does that look familiar to any other uh, any other film in the 80s? Uh, burning Away in the Flesh? Uh, you're not talking about... Because this ma- the, the makeup artist who won the Oscar for this, uh, uh, I guess, did a, a similar burning of the skin makeup, whatever, in the 80s. A pretty famous one. I had... Hold on. If I get this wrong, edit it out. It's it's um, staying in. <laughs> we are a very transparent podcast. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'll take uh, I'll take it out. <laughs> I'll say Firestarter, even though I have no idea. Oh, it's a pretty fa- it's a famous movie. I, like, I'm not saying that's not, but it's like pretty. Yeah, yeah. People well, know probably that against, movie more than this one. You got something against Drew Barrymore? <laughs> no, I'm just saying this. The movie it is is way. It's, Way more popular than that one. Probably more popular than The Fly. Right. Okay. Definitely more popular than The Fly. It's not a movie that's It's not a horror done, movie. Is it? Oh, no. then never mind. I it's don't know. the guy who did the um, the makeup for this film did the makeup for Indiana Jones and the Raiders of the Lost Ark, and more specifically, the Ark of the Covenant scene, where they open the Ark oh. of the Covenant and all the Nazis get their faces melted off from that scene in Indiana Jones and they look away. So that whole makeup was done by the guy who did the flies makeup and also gremlins. Oh, mm-hmm. okay. Yeah. Shout out to gremlins. Um, okay. Yeah. I yeah. wasn't close at all. <laughs> that was like fire starter. Cause of fire. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so that's makeup, and another interesting fact that I just found about the guy who did the score, oh, I, I wish I had his name. I wrote it actually down so I didn't forget it. Um, Howard Shore, he did the score for this one. Um, I believe he has done every movie since 1979 with Cronenberg, and he won the Oscar for the score for Lord of the Rings. So, Wow, that's yeah, pretty impressive. Pretty pretty. Uh, famous people are on this, or successful people did this movie. 
Mm-hmm. And uh, last trivia fact about production, we can talk about the film again. Do you guys know who one of the producers were of this film? Robin Williams. Yes. No, but you're on the right track. <laughs> no, Mel Brooks was one of them, wasn't he? Yeah, Mel Brooks. But he didn't want people to know because, like, they, he was afraid they wouldn't take it seriously. Mm-hmm. But then, yeah. like, they found out inevitably anyway. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So Mel Brooks. Produced. I actually did not. I did not know that at all. Actually. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mel Brooks, Blazing Saddles, The Fly. <laughs> um. Have you guys seen The Fly 2? Uh, no. I was just about ready to bring up sequels. Uh, I have not seen The Fly yeah, 2. I have. What oh, do you yeah. think of it? Because I know that it's not by the same director. <laughs> it's pretty terrible. Really? <laughs> <laughs> um, it's more horror elements mm-hmm. from what I remember. It's a lot... I want to say gorier because of like just the fact that it has a lot more blood. Mm. But like less body horror Mm -hmm. and I want to say that it's um Jeff Goldblum's son Mm -hmm. that's like Martin Brundle he's kept yeah he's captured like by the government or some shit and they're making him finish his father's project and then he finds out about his dad's project and he's like I'm gonna turn myself into a fly Mm mhm I'm pretty sure... It's been a while since I've seen that movie, but I'm pretty sure that's how it goes. Yeah. I think that... He's kind of like... He, he's a little deranged, like the reanimator guy. Mm-hmm. It's, my, it's the vibe I got from him. Yeah. That's kind of what I picked up from, from reading about it, and it was directed by the makeup guy of this movie, Chris Walsh, or whatever his name was. So he directed it, but... Yeah, it is more bloodier because I guess there's a like, there's there becomes a body count in in the in the fly too. Like he's killing people, right? Yeah. And that's not that's not a premise in in the fly. Like he's not out murdering people. They they took that out of the movie because they didn't want that. So it's bloodier in that respect, I guess, because it's different. It's like killing instead of just body horror specifically. But yeah. But I guess there was a lot of. Uh, in my research, a lot of talk about like what the sequel would be, like, and this is what they ended up with. But apparently, Cronenberg wanted to do one. Um, Rennie Harlan, who was Gina Davis, I don't know if they're still married, but they were. He had the script ready to go, and Cronenberg had one that was different than this one. Um, and eventually, they landed on this one, and like nobody was on board. Like Jeff Goldblum has a cameo in it, right? And that was it. But. There's supposed to be a sequel with all of them, like Gina Davis and like uh, Jeff Goldblum. That Cronenberg wanted to do. Mm-hmm. They fucked up. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but also The Fly Two is a remake as well, right? Wasn't there a Fly Two like in after the original one in the fifty eight? Oh wait, yeah, yeah, you're right. Isn't there? Yeah, so like both of yeah, these are is. remakes. Yeah. Wow. All right. Mm-hmm. But it's like I have no idea what the Fly Two from the fifties is like. I have no idea. I don't either. But I was like, I thought there was a Fly Two, after the. Yeah, it's like ret- it's like Return of the Fly or something like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Which we didn't really talk about. Um, you mentioned it's Jeff Goldblum's son, and then the second one. That is a plot point in the Fly, is that. Um, yes. Ronnie, which is played by Gina Davis. She becomes pregnant, and she's not sure if she's pregnant with Jeff Goldblum's son before he went to the telepod or not, is what I get. So she's afraid that this thing's going to come out a gen- genetically mutated fly person. So she's very apprehensive of what she's going to do. And she there's a dream sequence that I thought was real for a second that's that was very grotesque of her um, going to get an abortion, right? And this weird larva-type creature comes out it was a dream Ugh. yeah that was pretty crazy which uh that's a cameo by david cronenberg as the gynecologist in case anybody was wondering for trivia facts <laughs> <laughs> he was credited for that of course role. he is mm-hmm. 
feel like he always plays like a weird doctor in this mm. shit. Yeah, I I read and I don't know how true it is that like Martin Scorsese said to him once that he looks like a what a like a Silicon Valley like plastic surgeon. That's like what he looks like. So whenever he does cameos, he now does them as like doctor type characters. <laughs> mm-hmm. I guess I own it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But yeah, um, well, I mean, now that I know that there's a fly too, which I didn't at the time that I finished watching the movie, um, yeah, we're kind of left with uh, not really knowing what Gina Davis is going to do, you know, as as far as, uh, you know, having um, Seth's baby. So I'm glad to see that's addressed in the sequel, I guess, if nothing else. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I don't need to see it, so I'm just gonna leave it. Yeah, I hear it doesn't hold up to the the original very well. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I've seen worse sequels. Honestly, it's just like definitely a huge letdown because of how great the fly is. Mm-hmm. It's like you going from Terminator to Terminator Five is like how big a drop down in quality <laughs> or something in that you know what I mean? It's mm-hmm. just like there's still some entertainment value there, I guess. Mm-hmm. Maybe Terminator one and Terminator three or something. I don't even know what Terminator Fair Five is like. I haven't seen it. <laughs> that's the yeah, that's like Genesis, right? That's the most recent one. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it is. Not happy not happy to have that off the top of my dome, but I think that's right. <laughs> Well, does anybody know, before we can go into, like, Defender Destroy, because I think we're hitting that area, how people compare it to the original? Like, this fly to the Vincent Price, because I know people like the Vincent Price 1958 version, but I didn't really come across anything of... I think this one's better, but I don't know how it holds up compared to the original. I... It's hard to gauge, because... Um, this one is so wi- more widely known. Yeah. Yeah, uh, especially by, like, it's, like, the fact that this is, uh, like, what, 40 years old now? Uh, no, 30. Yeah. Is it 30? Mm-hmm. Okay. I can't do that. Yeah. <laughs> um, but anyways, the, like, that's, like, got some time on it, and, like, we're the fucking 50s one that's a long ass time <laughs> yeah sure. and like people and just how i can gauge like uh people's reaction like if you're seeking out horror i feel like the fly the remake of the fly is going to come up closer to list than the one with vincent price because i like the original fly but it's like really boring mm-hmm. <laughs> and, like like, you gotta really be in the mood to watch, like, 50 sci-fi. Like, I, there's some great ones, and there's some, like, really bad ones. That one's, like, kind of, like, in the middle, where it's, like, the great thing about it is that it has Vincent Price in it for, like, ten minutes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, with that, are we up and ready for Defender Destroy of... The 1986. You know I'll so go who, first. Oh, all right. Oh, wow. Take it away. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm going to be heartily defending this movie. Um, I was interested the whole time, which is high praise coming from me. Um, I thought the acting was really good, especially coming from Jeff Goldblum. Um, I thought he really captured his character and his transformation really well. And, uh, you know, the movie was completely disgusting, and I loved it. And <laughs> you need to see it if you haven't seen it. All right. That's all I had to say. All right. So we got one defend. Um, Pete, you want to rock, paper, scissors? Who's next? I'll, I'll just go. All right, cool. <laughs> I don't like playing rock, paper, scissors. <laughs> <laughs> I'd rather do... Uh, no, I can't come up with another incarnation. <laughs> Is it one, two, three, shoot? 
and you shoot you know, numbers one, two, three, okay. right? And the higher number wins. Uh, I guess yeah, that works. I learned, but then why did you, no one no one would pick one? I don't know the exact rules. I learned it from Seinfeld, um, and George <laughs> always loses to Jerry. So, oh, odds and evens. Odds and evens. That's what it is. You got odds. I got yeah. evens. Okay. Yeah. <sighs> Anyways, <laughs> uh, I mean, obviously, I'm defending it. I made it pretty clear from the top of the podcast. Um, like. Pretty much like what Lindsay said, this movie's pretty gross, and it's well acted. It's I like, and you were pointing out the structure of the movie uh, earlier, where it's very well constructed thanks to Cronenberg's like fine tuning. And I always forget that, like, even though we just watched it, like, I always remember the last act, and it makes me think of, like, how much of an impact it had, and, like, that's why I was like, oh, it's 75% horror, 25% sci-fi, and then you're like, but the beginning, you know, it's it's all science fiction, and mm-hmm. then the second is, like, more of a button, I'm like, oh, yeah, I forgot about that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> because, like, God, the first time I watched the third act, I was like, oh, my God, what is happening? This right? is fucking ridiculous. Mm-hmm. Oh. And I don't, yeah, I don't really have much else to say about it. All right, okay. Um, so I guess that leaves uh, just me, just me to uh, defend or destroy. I'm gonna defend it. Um, I was a big fan, um, and I agree with Lindsay's point about Jeff Goldblum. Um, I actually found myself saying to. Him, my roommate that it's like one of I think Jeff Goldblum's best performances because even as the like when he's this grotesque figure, I was like feeling sympathetic for him and like I thought he did a really good job of portraying that person who's kind of like, you know, I mean he's in this tragic state of am I dying? Like he says that at one point, um, yeah. but he's trying to document what's happening, but kind of scared. He says he's afraid, um, so I thought he's really vulnerable, but also he's really aggressive at times. So he was great. Cronenberg really punched it up well. It's gross. It is very gross, but not uh, not overdone. Like it's it, it's not meant to like it doesn't go to an extreme degree. It's just somebody transforming, and they did a really good job of making it look real. And I thought Cronenberg was the the right person to do it. He's known as the director of Flesh, and he wanted to make a movie about like you know disease, growing old, um, confronting your mortality, which are which is all major tenets of horror. And he did it through a person literally decaying on screen. Um, yeah. So I thought that was great, and I think they they did a good job with remaking it, as well as you know, um, paying tribute to the original. They they kept tenants in there, and they also had the the famous "Help Me" line, which is famous from the original. Oh one. yeah. But in a whole different context in this movie, like this one is like I feel like in the original it's like "Help me," he's about to eat by a spider. So he's like screaming for help because he's about to die. But this one, he's like asking for help like get me out of this situation like just in general i'm afraid of what's happening i'm kind of i'm uh defenseless i don't know what to do i don't know Mm. it's a little bit different more tragic i felt like in this one where that one just seemed to be like comic comic horror almost i don't know anyway defend i'll shut up i really liked it i like the fly (laughs) (laughs) Mm -hmm. Mm. all right well with that you know that wraps it up an episode of it records thanks for tuning in uh, loyal listeners really really thank you for tuning in and being out there for us get on the forums let us know if you hated our opinions tonight we'd love to hear from you we're on twitter we're on facebook we got a nice website that you can subscribe to our email list and contact us and every friday we'll be turning out new episodes and we'll be trying to get mini mini episodes out to you soon and contests we're looking to get a contest going soon for all of you and we'll have the details up of that very soon. We have been <laughs> talking about that for, for so long. It's gonna happen. It's gonna happen. We've been talking for so long that I forgot about it. <laughs> <laughs> and then it came back and I got the general surprise again. That's a long time. Yeah, it's been a while. It's been on the been on the top shelf. So we'll have a contest out for you soon with details about how you can win a prize. That's right, a prize from the It Records gang. But until then... <clears throat> Watch for the information on our social media. And I'm Matt Johnson, who will remain in the shadows. I'm Peter, and I'm the ass man. <laughs>